I am so excited to bring Lea uh, to the stage. I have a, um, how you call it? Um, a crush on, a, on this personality. Uh, she's so funny. She's so creative. She's so colorful. And at the same time, she's so real. She tells her story. She shares her experience. She's one of the most open um, and real and authentic individual that I know that I have met online. Um, and I appreciate her for that so much. You know, being that I'm in the fashion business, so many people that I meet are not the same on screen and off screen. I really don't love that. And Leia is, 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 she is who she is. And you either love it or you don't love it. And if you don't love it, I don't know what you're drinking because you're missing out. So without further ado, here is Leia. <laughs> that introduction made me laugh so hard. Wow. I love how you like, if you love it, you love it. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Ellipsis. Yes. But... If you know, you know. I mean, whoever. I mean, let's them. not point out that you started off this entire episode by letting people know that you have a crush on my personality. So that's pretty funny. <laughs> Only like from people with a shade, though, will be like, I have such a crush. Like in the outside world, they'd be like, dude, that's a problem, you know? <laughs> Okay, so let me just first of all tell you that our community is not only Jewish. So anything that's very Jewishy, uh, you, you may need to translate it so everybody can participate and enjoy. But what a lot of people that are going to be watching don't know is that Leah comes from a Hasidic background. It's a sect of the Jewish community that it's extremely, extremely uh, religious, but also insulated in very sad on very particular ways. Um, and Leia came out as gay. And I, and at the same time, like right after exploded as a comedian. Uh, and I think, to correct me if I'm wrong, Leia, you were welcomed by I don't know, for by a large group, at the same time that you had a lot of backlash, there was a lot of people that welcomed you with open arms, is it not? Absolutely, absolutely. The only thing that you, the only part that you were missing there is that I was actually a very popular comedian in the religious community for a long time, many years, and that was before internet was popular. So I was on DVDs and I was on actual CDs and I was like printing them and reprinting them and selling like thousands of copies around the world, which is pretty big for like a Hasidic female comedian. Um, so I already had my run at that in the in the ultra orthodox community when i left and came back it was as a totally different kind of comedian let's just say that yes i'm so still figuring you, it out i would love i would love you know you know as a as part of the heal with gold community what i love to do is to bring examples of people that went through trauma went through tragedy went through tremendous adversity but they are finding a way to overcome. They're trying to grow their resiliency. They use grit and tenacity and, and purpose within their brokenness, and they find a way to overcome it. And I see so much of that. And I, I, I think I'm going to jump a little bit here. But one of the posts, I cried so much at one of your posts. When well, before you get into me and tell me what an amazing person I am, I do just want to say, because I'm sure you'll have fresh new listeners that aren't familiar with what the Healing with Gold community is, because, you know, they're new. So mm -hmm. I just want to say that I read your book. I got your book at a time in my life where I really, really needed it. Um, and I think it was just what I needed to hear. Your story is also very sad and pieced. And I, you know, obviously like off camera, we talked so I have a deeper understanding of where you're coming from. But the concept of healing with gold is what really, really struck me because I'm particularly sitting right now in my broken pieces and watching certain things happen that I can't control based on choices that I've made. And so reading the book at that time really hit me in a way that I needed it to hit. 
So can you just explain to my listeners and viewers what that is really quickly? And your book was incredible. It is a must read for those of you that are just tuning in. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, so I found out about Kintsugi. Kintsugi is the Japanese art of mending pot, broken pottery. And the Japanese, Japanese, they mend it with urushi, which is a natural lacquer that comes from a tree. It's actually very toxic. It's very interesting that it's very mm, toxic. toxic. I probably yes. love it. I'm a lesbian. <laughs> love that stuff. Hit me with that toxic. Um, and then they, they highlight whatever it broke with gold and making the piece stronger because the urushi is a very strong glue and beautiful because of the gold expensive. And the, the concept is to teach us that we all break and it is in how we mend that defines who we are. And instead of feeling like a broken piece that needs to be thrown and discarded, um, Doing the work of Kintsugi, doing the work of mending is exactly what makes us better for it. Um, the piece becomes more expensive. We become wiser, more unique, more special. And when I heard about Kintsugi, I was going through a terrible time in my life. I was broken to pieces. And my reaction to the video that I watched was, I want to be Kintsugi. I want to be that. I was looking at the pottery and I said, I want to be that. How, what do I do to be that? And that led me to interview uh, lots and lots of women who had gone through adversities and who were thriving. They were active members of society. They were helping other people. They were using whatever broke them to help other women. And I was so inspired by them. I kept notes about everything that I learned from those interviews. In those days, I was not doing video interviews. I was, I was just interviewing them and writing it down. And then I would write a blog and I would write two parts. One was their story and the other was three main lessons that I got from them. And then at the end of like two years of doing that, I started real, realizing that there was a pattern between these women and that the processes that they put in place to feel healed and then, you know, what it means to be healed, you, you, you are forever broken, right? A kintsugi piece was broken. It is together, but we're not hiding that it was a broken piece. Uh, it's an open piece in a way. Uh, mm. There is an openness. Um, but and I'm even prettier, which is what resonated with me, is that it was an even more beautiful result in the end and when I got that book I was deep in the throes of like these pieces are just so broken and so ugly and like I've been working on it my whole life and when will it end you know and I opened the book and I was like boom like it literally is designed to go over the cracks and beautify them and it resonated with me because I was like, actually, I'm pretty awesome. You know what I mean? Like, I am amazing and I am a superhero. And I feel like all the trauma that I've been through actually gave me even more superpowers. The mm -hmm. fact of the matter is my inboxes are flooded with people thanking me and sharing their stories. I cannot tell you how many people in our community, in our very own community, reach out to me sharing insane heartbreaking painful traumatic things and the fact that i get to be a light somewhere along their journey is bizarre it's bizarre in the coolest way yeah but this is exactly it because but but you know why your inbox is flooded your inbox is flooded because you are open because you are who you are online we mm -hmm. I struggle with it too. I mean, I struggle with even, you know, even in my authenticity, standing in it fully, you know, Listen, that's, that's a tough one sometimes too, because sometimes there are lies that we tell ourselves and. Okay. There are lies we tell ourselves. There are stories that we're not ready to share with everybody, but you are still that person. You're still Leia. You come there, you share your vulnerability, you speak about it. People understand that it's not always easy, 
that, that with the laughter, there is also a lot of trauma and people feel comfortable sharing with you because they know that you live it. That's actually really funny because I had therapy this afternoon and my therapist said to me, like, is this what you do, Leah? You just make jokes about your whole life? And I'm like, duh. I literally said, duh. And he started laughing because I'm like, I really do that a lot. <laughs> I need to chill. I will not, but I need to, but I won't. But I but I think that your humor and this lightness that you bring gives us permission to us all to laugh a little bit about everything that we're going through, you know? But I want, I want to bring people in to your story because I want people to understand the steps that you had to go through to get to where you are today. Um, and also understand how you use laughter to alleviate some of this pain. Um, so tell us, you. when did you... It's funny out? that you say that I use laughter to alleviate my stresses because <laughs> the person that actually... <clears throat> I was dating somebody and she said to me that I should have known that was a red flag that you were a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, listen, if the worst thing that is is that in a relationship when it's super tense, I'll make a joke like... I see it as a win. <laughs> I, I, I see it as a win, too. <laughs> um, so, Cher, when did you know that you were gay and that, and how did you have the strength to come out? And okay, share so I just want to clarify, and it's not just you, it's everyone who knows me, that I never actually came out as gay, and I never put a label on it. I'm not a big label person, not politically, not religiously, not sexually, so... I just am what I am. I'm a human and I like humans. Like, I don't like to put myself in a particular category. However, um, I think that I've always, always had intense emotional connections with women that I now look back and I realize that there was definitely some romantic feelings there. Um, and obviously talking to boys altogether was a sin because I grew up in the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic community, which is very different than orthodox and very different than modern orthodox and very different than reform and conservative and egalitarian it's a very specific niche of judaism which is very very right wing um so boys was not an option at all so of course girls was not an option I mean, in my mind, it was an option, but that started like literally third grade. I had this huge crush, but a real one on a girl up my block. And then it was my teacher. And then it was a friend in camp. And then girls would, you know, get undressed in the bunkhouse in our old girl sleepaway camp and say stuff like, you don't mind if I change in front of you. And I'd be like, I do not. In fact, uh, and so, yeah, so that's how I knew. So, but obviously that was a terrible sin. And also I didn't take it seriously. You don't consider your attraction to a girl serious. That's not what it's like. It's like, it's like someone who wants to like eat trafe, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like somebody who wants to gossip. It's something you don't do. So I did what every good Basiakov girl did. You know, my parents wanted me to get married and have a family and that's what I was raised to do that's what I knew best you know cooking cleaning um even though I'm, I'm not great at cleaning I am I'm a good cook though um but yeah so that's what I was raised to do and so that's what I did but years into my marriage which was a very big struggle um and people assume that it's because of me being attracted to women but actually my marriage did not dissipate because of that there was a lot of other things going on, and I didn't even have time to think about my attraction to women. I was raising a baby and working three jobs and trying to stay afloat, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I only got to tap into that much later on. We call it a lily, by the way. That's a later-in-life lesbian. That's someone yeah. who only figures it out later. So, yeah. like, I never had those physical and emotional experiences. I never had fun like that. I never went to bars you know, I skipped that whole stage and I just actually fell for someone in my community. That's what happened. And it was tumultuous and obviously extremely toxic because she had a husband and I had a husband and I was afraid to do anything and I was scared I was going to go to hell. 
And it took a lot, a lot, a lot of courage and self-love to actually even sort of admit it to myself. And I'll be very honest with you. I never came out. I was outed. So that was the crazy part, which is like I was barely getting in touch with my own comfortability with who I was. And then one day I woke up and it was slapped across Facebook and I lost my job and I lost my. Was that before a show that you were going to do? Um, probably, but also I knew that it was coming. I knew that the truth was going to reveal itself. It always does. And I had this foreboding sense. And the last year or two that I was still doing comedy in the height of my career, it just felt disgusting. Every time I would get off stage, I would feel sick, like that I'm going to get caught. And I was also a teacher in two popular Jewish high schools. So I was also terrified. I was teaching, you know, teenagers and you know how it is in our community. So my whole life was on the line, my family, my community, my job, my child, because our community is very strict with, you know, and again, when I say our community, I want to preface that this is just my ultra orthodox Hasidic experience I'm not talking about anyone else's experience Mm -hmm. you know um but you know from my experience and my friends experiences we had to deal with child protective services coming in and trying to say that we're unfit parents which is insane because I worked so hard and like I said never went to a bar never drank never did like I was raising a baby and having a job I only later did I start to discover like non-Jewish music and like movies and all the joys that the outside world has to offer, you know, which I now realize like as an, you know, I consider myself somewhere along the, you know, religious Orthodox spectrum. And, um, and I realized that you can do that and still be religious and Orthodox, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So, or be whatever, be whatever you want to be, be a decent human being, honestly. So yeah, so that's what happened. And I was outed and I left and I started a new life and I switched careers and I raised my kid and I still kept a very private life and I was still very closeted um, out of respect for my family. But unfortunately I had an event that happened and that became public knowledge and it was slapped on the cover of the daily news. And once again, I was outed as a lesbian, which is crazy. Cause I never had said that. I never said I was even a lesbian, you know? And so again, it was like, I had to face it along with everyone else, you know, mm-hmm. which is basically what happens when truth reveals itself. It just bears its ugly head whenever it feels like it. So, um, you know, blessings in disguise. So how did your family react and, that must have been traumatic. You suddenly were outed and now you have to deal with that, but you also have to deal with everybody's reactions to it. I was actually discussing it in therapy today because I'm not sure that I... Sorry. We spoke off camera. I told you today's a particularly hard day for me. Um, I'm not sure, actually, that I ever really processed this piece of the puzzle, how my, basically my whole family, you know, like abandoned me for lack of better word. And I also have a lot of compassion for my family because I understand that who I am and what I represent and also our particular family d- dynamics was complicated. And I don't think that has to do with religion. I think it has to do with health, like emotional and mental maturity and health. Um, but yes, I will say that even if I had the opportunity to connect with family members at this point, I'm not really looking for that kind of thing anymore. I feel like I didn't get what I needed and I don't need it anymore from them. It's too hard to get that kind of comfort after all these years of the pain. Um, But I guess like this Pesach, it really hit me hard. Like, you know, I spent significant time alone and I just thought like, this sucks. Like, you know, not having family to go back to, especially around Yom Tovim or Shabbos. It's hard. 
But at least, I not but and not at least, but I can say that it's okay. It's sad. Life is allowed to be sad and painful sometimes. I'm allowed mm-hmm. to say that, you know, and there's space for it. So, yeah. It's, um, there is something that I learned from Dr. Demartini. Do you know Dr. Demartini? No, I mean, I know what a martini is, but obviously I have to say that, <laughs> dude. <laughs> um, Dr. Demartini is fantastic. And I think you're going to love his teachings. But one thing that he uh, taught me in his classes and everything that he teaches is that there is perfection in the world. We don't necessarily see it, but everything that each individual needs, he gets. The problem is that we as individuals, we have expectations to get it from specific people. And when we don't get from that specific person, we feel like we were wrong and we can't even have our eyes open that we actually got what we needed. It just came from somebody else. And he talks about when he left home as a teenager and he hitchhiked and then he took a plane to to Hawaii, he wanted to be a surfer. He was living in the streets in in a tent and this woman saved his life because he had drunk so much and he was passed out and she she brought him back and gave him juice and hydrated him and, and took care of him. And he was saying later on, as he sees in different times of his life, how there were individuals that stepped in and took the job that he expected it to be either from a parent, from a family member, from a boss, but other people fulfilled that uh, job. And do you feel like you had people in your life that were giving you some of that love that you weren't getting from your family? Like, I don't want to substitute one for the other. Like, I think that the kind of love that you can get from family might not be the kind of love that you get from friends or lovers or children or parents. You know, it's all different. Um, I think love is abundant. And I think there's plenty of it everywhere. I think different times in my life, I feel different things about it. But I will say I have a complicated relationship with love I'm learning I'm learning to let love in and also to love properly mm-hmm. how how are you what is your connection your relationship with the more modern orthodox community because I felt at some point I, I don't know that I have followed every single one of your posts but I saw some posts where you were saying, talking more about Chavez and talking more about, you know, keeping the Sabbath and and keeping the laws of Kashrut, which is our laws of how we eat. And I started feeling that you were reconnecting in a stronger and more meaningful way. Is that so? Hell yeah. Um, You know, again, raised where I was raised, like I didn't have an appreciation for actual Torah or, you know, or Midos, or connecting with God, probably because of, let's be honest, the intense, like, physical trauma, you know, and and, and mental trauma that I, I went through with my family dynamics, didn't really let me believe that all the stories I heard about, like, Hashem loves us the way a father loves a child, or the way a mother loves a child, because that idea was screwed up in my head. So I couldn't really connect it to Judaism, And then it just became a bunch of rules and things I have to do and things I can't do. I am interesting. I have a weird way of thinking. And I also love music. And I like performing art. And I like, you know, singing and dancing in weird places. And so coming from where I came from, there was no space for that. I had no individuation. However, you know... As things changed, I reconnected with things that actually mattered to me. 
Judaism matters to me. And I'm not saying that it should to everyone or it's meant to, but I do think that there's purpose in life. And I also think that in order to recover and be healed or healing, I need spirituality in my life. That's important to me. I'm not saying it's on everyone's top 10. On me, it's my top 10. Um, knowing that no matter where I am in the world, I have a place to go on Shabbos. That's super cool. Um, it definitely adds a lot of dimension to my life. There's nothing like a Shabbat dinner, warm challah, vibes. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, tell me about your comedy. Tell me about your sources of inspiration. I mean, you have so many characters. They're all so perfect. Where do you get the inspiration for all of them? How do you well, come up? Very interesting that you're asking me this today because people are asking me, like, when are you doing more shows and stuff like that? I have some things booked that, like, I committed to, but the truth is, is that I'm really focused. I, I just, like, I switched my business recently and I'm super busy with that. A lot of people don't realize that I have an actual career that doesn't involve comedy. Because I am a social media presence, they assume that this is what I do full time. If you would only know how not full time I do this, I would say on an average day, I do not invest more than 10 minutes to my social media. I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, um, but I create content. I put it out when I feel like it. There's, you know, and stuff like that. And the shows, obviously, that I do have to write material for, depending on what I do and for who I do it for. I was in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago, and there I did a whole, like, a musical, you know, like a comedy musical performance. So it depends on, and it was a theme night. So it depends. I'm doing something also big coming up also out of town that I, you know, I'm also doing something totally animated and different. But for the most part, my observations are my comedy. I see things, they're hilarious to me, and I write jokes about them. And um, and maybe I'm the only one that thinks I'm funny. Like, I think my real jokes, the, my day-to-day -day jokes about my life is funny. I'm not so sure my characters are like, but you know, everybody, the good news is, is that humor is subjective and everybody likes different things. I have my Russian because I grew up in Brooklyn. So like, you know, the girls on the train that were like, you know, from Brighton Beach, you know, and you know, and then I got like, you know, cause I grew up in like Brooklyn. So, you know, Marlene, she give attitude, you know, and, and then of course, hello, hello. So I've got, you know, and then the yeshivish lady and whatever. And then, of course, there's the single girl that's like desperate to get married. And then I developed Bela, which is like my inner child that desperately needs a voice to answer back to all the adults around her that don't let her be who she needs to be. Um, and I actually have a couple of new ones like in the works. But it's interesting to see what people connect with. Like I have a character called Melody, you know, and she's like she's rainbow hair. And she has two children named Firefly and Rainbow, you know? <laughs> so I I see, and I, I like I like to teeter on the edge, so it's fun. So I like to see what gets people what what gets people's budgies in a bunch. Yes, I love them all. I don't know what to say. I can't pick a favorite. But I am shocked to know that this is not what you do full time. I didn't know. I, I was sure that you were a full-time comedian. Oh, God, so that would be exhausting. Honestly, even back in the day when I was performing for only, only religious women, by women, for women, even then it wasn't a full-time thing. I had always, I was teaching full-time, and then I also did this on the side. And now I like it. I like this flexibility. Like, I love the community. I love comedy. Um, I don't like the comic community. Um because it's like every other field, there's like the people that I'm in home care. So there are like the biggies in home care. And they're like the ones that are like at all the dinners and events. And it's like everybody knows them. And kind of that's comedy. You know what I mean? And it's about who you know and how you got that spot. I'm old, man. I'm 41 years old. Like I, I, I don't want to do that. And I can't imagine relying on people's laughs full time for validation and money. It seems exhausting to me. And it's so interesting you saying that because as a fashion designer, which I don't consider myself a fashion designer at all, um, but I'm in the world of fashion, it's exhausting. This is not, you know, I tell people all the time, I don't love it. This is not, you know, first of all, I'm not into fashion. 
Uh, to me, it's more the message of what my clothing can bring, how people can feel about it. It's about the story. It's about healing with gold. It's about transformation and being a Sherpa and helping people um, get to where they want to get uh, through action. But I wanted also to speak to you about your new show on Tuesday nights. Is it every week? What are you doing? You're doing it weekly? Okay. So, honestly, like I said, I'm really going through it right now. Hello, everyone. You're meeting me in the thick of it. Um, but, you know, I've been noticing some things that I need to make changes in my life. And I've been noticing that a lot of those things are deeply tied to things that I've been through and hard truths that I have not been able to utter out of my mouth. And I think it's time. Like, I just need to. And that's all I need to do. So I was like, how can I do this and also impact, make, make it just not an impact for me, impact people? And I'm like, let's talk about it. So, like, I'm not a professional, but, bro, I've been through some severe things. So every week I bring on different professionals in the field. Like, my first topic was on trauma and addiction. So I brought down somebody who runs a recovery place. And then I also brought down someone who specializes in codependency addiction. So we covered behavior and substances. And this coming week is a tough one. I'll be talking about um, sexual abuse, the trauma of sexual abuse. And, um, and I'm having this incredible rabbi from Utah, Rami Zippel. I don't know if you know who he is, but he is. Whoa. Yes. I, okay. know, I know people that he saved their lives. You can't even imagine. So he's going to be on the show. And then I'm also having, um, I'm also having Dr. Sarah Glass, who's a therapist and she also specializes in sexual abuse. So, um, and also comes from our community and struggled with, um, her own identity. So also like a dual, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting that I, that I have this platform and sometimes I'm like, ooh, am I doing enough? You know, because I, I do feel like people listen, and I love that. Um, I'm pretty grateful that I have the, the opportunities that I do. And also, like, it nourishes me just like it nourishes others. I, I really think so. I know that sounds cheesy, but it's true. No, it's very true. I want you to know that from the women that I interviewed, when they achieved a place where they felt semi whole, they weren't not broken, right? I, I interviewed the one that was the hardest for me. Um, her story is terrible. It's in, it's in my blog. It's a very difficult story. She still suffers from PTSD. It's not that she went through such a trauma, but she is a She's a thriver. She considers herself a thriver. And that's because she's helping other women who, who were abused in the matter that she was. And I think that through the giving, through, through using your platform, your laughter, your followers, the people that you know, and you help other people, through that is the goal. I find that that is the goal. When we yeah, think like, you know, they say hurt people, hurt people, and heal people, heal people. So, listen, I'm out there healing, and, like, I'm happy to share. Here, guys, take a whole bunch of it, you know? It's linear. It really is. But I will say that I feel like right now I'm at the, like, precipice. You know what I mean? Because there's been so many big pieces. I, I know you asked me earlier on about an Instagram post. I'm assuming it's about my mother. Yes. Is that the one you want to talk about? Yes, I do. Let's but talk let's about see. mom, shall we? Yes, okay. but I just want to put this question here. Uh, this is Rabbi Zippo from uh, the Rabbi in Utah. So I just wanted to, to answer that. Um, and by the way, uh, Leah can see all the, you can see all the comments, right? Yeah. So after the show, if we don't answer all of your questions and comments, we will definitely get back to you. We just don't want to interrupt now, uh, but we will answer all of your questions. Um, I wanted to talk about mom because um, that that post hit me hard. I mean, I, I have to tell you that I have gone back to your Instagram page and scrolled and looked for that post to read it multiple times. That's how uh, powerful it was. 
And actually, I think it's really important for people to know, you know, when you're putting, uh, if you're putting stuff out there, sometimes I feel that I'm talking to nobody. You know, there, there are people that become so, um, they, they, they become like a force of nature. Their words travel, and it's very clear yeah. that, that that they make an impact right other people are more quiet i sometimes i say well i'm not making an impact i'm not inspiring people i don't know that i am you know i i find it that my voice is a quiet voice i don't know how to explain that to you but then people tell me oh i read this by you i saw this by you i i today i got a, a four minute video testimonial unexpected you know i i received an 11 minute voice note of a, a, I cried so much, you know, of what that person told me of how my work min, meant to her. But we don't know that, right? We only know sometimes when people get back to us. And I wanted you to know that that post was very strong for me, very impactful for me, very meaningful. That's why I wanted to bring it here. Um, first of all, I wanted you to know that I read a book called Fault Lines. And maybe you, you want to read this book uh, the, I forgot the author. Uh, it came out, I think, maybe, I don't know, four or five years ago. And it's a book written by a PhD. And he writes that 40% of families have a disconnect. You know, people break up and they don't speak ever again or, or they don't speak with each other for many, many years. I call it loss of the living. Um, it is a worse than death pain, in my opinion, because there's no closure every single day. You know that that person is going on and you cannot be part of their lives. And I, I think I see it as torture. You know, I was discussing with my therapist today because like I said, hello everyone, you're meeting me in the thick of it. I'm like experiencing really intense grief. And it's interesting because after my mother died, I experienced crazy grief, like it, very weird. I would be in the shower, I would be eating and like suddenly stuff would like taste like sand and I would just feel like this cloud of darkness. Obviously I now realize that, you know, that was all a grief and it was a different kind of grief because when she was alive, I hadn't spoken to her for many years and also my family, but Look, maybe I'm in denial, but I did text her every Shabbos. And I would often call, like, before Yom Em Tovim and leave her message. She never blocked me, so I would consistently reach out. And then she died. And I think about it a lot. Um, which pain was worse? Like, her being alive and um, and me not having a relationship with her or her being dead and me not having a relationship with her. And I realized that actually was, it was her being alive. That was actually harder for me because my, my nervous system is so used to limbo and a roller coaster and a maybe that that's what I held on to for so long. Maybes, you know? And I found that I've been doing that most of my life. I've been hanging on to maybes. Mm -hmm. um, the maybes have actually depleted my energy so much because instead of just accepting reality for what it was and using my energy for things where it mattered, I was giving my energy towards a brick wall practically. And that's, what was so frustrating, but it's my normal. It's my normal baseline is to live in maybe. And I guess I've gone somewhere to the opposite extreme where I no longer want maybes. I'm so done with all the maybes that if there's a maybe, um, it's a no, you know, and it doesn't matter who you are or what position you play in my life. I don't accept maybe. And today my therapist pointed out that maybe I'm a little bit too rigid. Like, I'm not leaving room for maybe. And I'm like, well, I don't want to leave room for maybe. I'm tired of maybe. And he was like, well, that's actually a trauma response too, you know? Um, so thank you, mom, for that. But overall, I will say that there's, you know, when the child part of you is constantly craving something that won't be or that you think it will be, 
that does become your level and your barometer of normal. Assuming that crumbs are normal and that, who knows, maybe. So on the one hand, I'm like, I'm such a hopeful person. Look at me. I'm always hoping. As long as I see a maybe, to me, that's a potential. Yes. I'm Jewish. I'm a businesswoman. You know what I mean? All I need is a client to be like, well, you know, we're opening a social daycare. So there's a chance we could send you referrals. Say no more. I'll have my people there with bagels and coffee. You know what I mean? And I will call and email you every single week. And so you'll start off by sending me one or two, but eventually I'll be so pushed you can't get rid of me. You know, so it works in business. In my personal life, it hasn't translated. Um, so I think that's where I am right now. I'm struggling to stay rooted in reality and conserve my energy for things that are not maybe. But the grief is alive and kicking. And I'm constantly walking around with, it hits me and it debilitates me. I'm frozen and I can't move for like three. And today I, I was telling you before we went on air that like I'm particularly struggling because I'm currently grieving multiple things, connections, relationships, pe important people or I'm just in maybe, and it has to be okay. It has to be okay, but it's not, but it has to be. Yeah. You know, I learned from my personal experience that the, the secret to, to deal with the maybes is the surrender. It's the true surrender to what is, you know, without knowing what's going to happen in a minute, the problem is, yeah, I understand that the surrender is the answer. How do you surrender is the question, and which I don't have the answer. I don't think that there is one path to figure out how to surrender to just be in this moment. Because at the end of the day, if we can live fully immersed in the now, in this particular second of today, right? In this moment that we're here right now and not to, not to worry about what's going to be when we hang up and the things that we need to do and not to regret things from the past and question conversations. If we can just be in the now at all times, that's the surrender, is us being focused on being who we can be, the best that we can be at this very moment. The problem is that we are so programmed to have goals, to have a mission, to achieve, right? And then we think we're all the time measuring to get where I want to get based on my past. How can I get? How can I? And we forget about the now. And we forget about the now. That That is the maybes. Maybe tomorrow this person is going to call me. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to get the job. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to make money. Maybe tomorrow my family will accept me as I am. And, and that is exhausting. And I think that how we, how you were talking and, and to me, it was so, so, so let me ask you a question. I mean, I know we're live. Does you, does your audience understand your grief? Like to some extent, do you talk about this publicly? No, I don't talk. Whoever read my book, I tell that there was a break in the family and I just don't tell the story publicly because the story is not only mine and I obviously don't want to ever say anything that could hurt the other person. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. So like, I'm also very nuanced, you know, because there's things that I do share, but there's plenty of things that I don't share, you know, but also I understand and, and, the breaks. And by the way, that is even part of the problem. Because you were so afraid to communicate your pain because you don't want to hurt the other person, because you don't want to, uh, because th there is multiple stories in one story, right? I only know my story, but the other person has their own story and all stories are valid. And it's not a matter of truth. It, each person has their own truth. 
So people know that they know that the the you know and that I call the loss of the living. Um, I don't know how many people follow me consistently. Some people are new people that come in because they come because they want to listen to the to the guests, so they don't follow follow people. She's bomb. <laughs> but you know the the thing is, the I think that we are all in search for healing for some trauma for some, from some grief. We don't know how to feel feelings. I shared a story this morning. If you go to my Instagram, I, I put a live and I told a story that I lost a pair of glasses. Okay. My, my husband had two strokes. Must have been. Yes. <laughs> but I call it also loss of the living because my husband is no longer the person that I met and that we got married. He behaves differently. He acts differently. So it's not that same person. My husband had given me a pair of glasses. And he, it was very sweet and it was after the strokes. So I was so emotional about that gift, that token. And then I lost the glasses two weeks after he gave me. And Leah, I lost it. I cried like a baby because of a pair of glasses. And it wasn't the glasses, right? It was what the glasses meant after all, because it, he, he, it was such a show of love um, that was so dear to me. Um, and one, and I, I yelled at the God, by the way, uh, I, I shared that on my Instagram that I had a whole conversation in which I told God I lost, I, I lost family members. I lost my father at 30 days after my husband had his first stroke. My father died. I was very close to my father. I lost my house. I lost a lot. I lost. So from every health, I lost so much. And I said, God, do I really also need to lose a pair of glasses? It was a token of love. Did I need to lose that? Like, I really think that you a little exaggerated. I got the message. I don't need to lose his glasses too. And so I cried and I said, am, am I ridiculous that I'm crying for something material? Glasses, come on, it was $200. I can save it and buy it again. You know, am I being silly? There's people that are sick and, and doing chemo, doing this, doing that, and I'm crying. And then I said, no, but emotions is energy in motion. And we need to let it get through us. If we hold the pain and the grief, that is the problem. That breaks us from inside, right? Because it's that bomb that we kept it and kept it and kept it. And one day it explodes and we don't know what to do with ourselves. And that's when we have a complete emotional breakdown. But if every time that we feel some level of pain. We allow ourselves, we gift ourselves the opportunity. Yeah. The problem it. is, and you can understand this, and like as someone who has CPTSD, it's like when I'm finally like dealing with one thing and I'm finally like coming to the point where I'm accepting this thing, boom, it's like another thing, right? So, and they're all like, well, now, you know. Dear Lord, please give me a break for a hot minute. I'm dealing with a lot right now. But, you know, growing up from a young age, that's what it was. It was an exposed amount of time to specific things that affected me, right? So it's like, even when those things were over, I never really gave it space. I never spoke about it. In fact, not only didn't I speak about it, I changed the story in my head to make it more manageable. And that's how I would say the story to others. And I would even protect people. And, you know, embellish things to make it sound, which is crazy. Why the heck would I do that? It was awful enough or good enough, you know? But um, so that's the difference between experiencing something once versus experiencing something over and over again, you don't have a chance. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like a business needs a minute to make money before they put in more money for other expenses. Like I need my bank, my emotional bank needed a minute. Yeah. But I'm out here. So let me tell you. in it. But that's how I felt. And I told God, right? I think you went uh a little too far here. I think you did a little too much. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> you need another show. But I'm going to tell you what happened. Because something beautiful happened. Always. 
And what happened was the following. After I allowed myself to cry, and when I started with the voices, Miriam, this is silly, I said, no, it's not silly. That's not silly. I'm entitled to cry this loss. I'm not crying for the glasses. It is the whole way that he gave me, how he gave me, right? And, and losing it. After that, I did my cry. I did my sniffling. I did everything. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to take action. And I believe that action will save us from our own demise. And I said to myself like that, I'm going to do something. I'm going to take an action. And it's a crazy thing that I'm going to do. But if it's meant to, to resolve the problem, it's going to resolve. I don't need to take 10 actions. I'm going to take one action. And God, if you heard me and you think that maybe I'm right, maybe it's, this was a step too far, you're going to solve my problem. And what I did was the following. I wrote an email to the company of the watch, the, of the glasses. But I want you to know something I bought from Amazon. I didn't buy from them. So I write an email to Maui Jim and I write to them like that. I'm a customer since 2012. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you now. You have no obligation to do anything about it. It's a long shot, but this is what happened. And I told them the story of what happened. And I said, and I lost two weeks after he gave it to me. And you have no obligation to give it to me, but I, don't, I can't afford one right now. Maybe I'll save it in with time, but can you do anything for me? The short part of the story, shortening, they sent me a free glasses. They sent me a free pair of glasses. That's what's up. And I... You manifested uh, that. I felt so hugged by God, you know? I felt validated. I felt heard. Now, could it have been that they would have said, I'm so sorry that this happened to you? Then it would have been the message that I wasn't meant to have it. And it would have been still very sad. But the beauty of the story was that at the end of the day, I had a conversation and I was granted something. And you know what? If I had bottled that pain away and not felt it and not then taken action, I would have never solved the problem for sure. And I think that this is a lesson that we need to, it's a simple example. It's a stupid example, but it shows how you're, we're allowed to feel the pain. We earned that. Like we earned the gold strike, right? We earned, we earned that break. We earned that wrinkle. We earned it. So we're, in, we're allowed to feel it. We're allowed to, to cry for it. We're allowed to grieve it. And then we take action and we do something. Yeah. Something, yeah. Something so happens. it's like stopping your brain from being like, you know what? We're not going to acknowledge this pain. We're just going to bury it and we're going to keep going. And we're going to keep putting band-aids on it and we're going to keep avoiding it. Then eventually it'll blow up in our face. So, yeah, I totally agree with you and work in progress. Yeah. And I think that the show that you're doing, it's in a way that opportunity i and i think that you were giving the, i reached out to you as soon as you i'll be posted. honest i did not record this week's episode for one reason and one reason only normally i do i would i have people in my life that i really care about that um struggle with addiction and i don't want them to feel that it's particularly about them or anything that I referenced was personal because it wasn't. It's generally my experience of what it's like to love an addict or, you know, be friends with one or have to care for one and the responsibility to come along with it and also the boundaries that you have to set, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't post it for personal reasons. It was a phenomenal talk. And I spoke with, like I said, these people that run a sober house and a recovery home and it was so good to hear their perspective on what it is like for an addict. And then also having, you know, a Leon talk about, um, you know, being addicted to a behavioral tendency. These are really important things that people need to hear next week. I'm definitely recording. It's I'm a little bit nervous. I'm going to be honest because it's sexual abuse. And I feel like it's, you know, a, a taboo subject, but also listen, as someone who's experienced different abuses, like from, hiding my identity to, you know, 
religious abuse, financial abuse, physical abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I will say that people assume that the sexual abuse is the worst, you know, and as someone who's experienced a couple of different things on the spectrum, I can't speak for everyone, but I can say that I think there were other things that hit me harder in life um, that messed up with my mind. Obviously your body's attached to your mind and what it does, you know, but, but I, I'm so excited to be talking about, well, I'm not doing much of the talking. Like I said, I have these two guests on, at least I can take a step back and be like, you're not a professional. But um, I think to be able to bring these talks to a larger audience and give people the space to be like, this actually happened to you. So you're allowed to have the space right now to be like, I'm a survivor. I didn't want to say those words out of my mouth. I didn't want to say that I was a survivor. Because that implies that I gave someone permission to hurt me, that I allowed certain things to happen to me that were, you know, um, taboo and shouldn't have happened. Um, but it's okay. Like, I want to put that out there. I want to say those words because once I say those words, it's a fact. And, you know, if anything, you're right. It's, it's healing with gold. It's even more beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And I think that you are giving people permission to have their space to grieve. And and when when you posted that you were going to do this was when I created the courage to reach out to you. Because I have wanted to reach out to you for so long. And I always felt, oh, you know, she's this important person. Who I get that all the time. People message me and they're like, you probably don't respond, you know, or you're probably not even going to see this message. Now, I don't sit and check my messages in morning, noon, and night, but I do put aside time, and I do. It matters to me. Like, I don't advertise my shows anywhere but on social media, and the fact is I sell out my shows, right? So that says something. That means that people matter, and, I can yeah, I consider, like, my followers, supporters, not followers. I, I have good support. They're yeah. not, you know, they're not my everyday friends. But it's a nice, it's a nice little, I say if the universe sends it, take it. A hundred percent. And that what gave me the courage. You know, when you posted that you were going to start that, I said, that's it. I'm reaching out to her. I need to bring And here we are. And here we are. And I'm so, so grateful. And I want to know, because we're about to close the show, and I wanted to know if you have some parting words that you want to share with anybody who's here live, who's going to watch it on replay. And, and after you tell me that, I'm just going to go through some uh, of the messages because there was one here that I wanted to post it. Look at this. This is one of the most powerful events I've experienced. Yay. Um, okay, so I'll leave you with this, okay? Um, like I said, if you're just tuning in, welcome welcome to this work in progress. But um, I was, like I said, I'm going through a hard time, and I was talking to um, this rabbi that I met, and he said to me, you know how you know you're healing? Instead of resorting to your usual coping mechanisms when you're struck with something incredibly painful, you double down on your healing. That's how you know that you're getting stronger. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. So instead of being like, woe is me, I'm going through this horrible time and looking for something to you know, become addicted to and numb myself and to escape or hide out and become depressed and, you know, and, and that, no, I'm going to choose opposite action and I'm actually going to get up even earlier and watch the sunrise and make sure that I'm in shul on time and, you know, and take care of my health even more and feed myself better food and take better care of myself, you know, and make sure I spend time in the sun and near the ocean and laughing and with community and friends. Boom. Then I'm ready to heal because it doesn't change that I need healing, but it changes how I'm going to heal, which is in an open forum. So that's my that's my little tidbit, and it's not from me, it's from this rabbi, this super cool rabbi that I met, which is basically just, if you are going through some darkness, and I believe that we all do that sometimes, you know, instead of propelling yourself further 
into darkness by the things that you've done in the past. Break the habit and propel yourself into the light by doing the things you haven't done before. That's it. I love it. I love it. And it's so true. And it's all about taking action uh, in positive ways. And I love it. It's meaningful. It's apropos. And, and I'm so happy that you shared. I just want to take a few uh, comments and put up some of them up. Uh, oh, this is an interesting question. Do you think Jews are being made fun of more now? Well, definitely a time of great anti-Semitism. But fun? I didn't understand that. I think I, I, I it's like probably the verbiage is off. Um, but I think the concept is, yes, is there more anti-Semitism now than ever? And I will say that we live in a really funny time. We just do. Yes, there is more anti-Semitism. It's funny because like I... I recently got this, which I really, really like, but it's super duper big. So wherever I go, people are like, oh my gosh, that's so big. Are you Jewish? And I'm like, yes, very proud <laughs> Jew here. Um, and not everybody likes that, but I'm a big Jew. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, to answer the question, yes, there's more. There's definitely, well, is there more anti Semitism? We had the Spanish Inquisition, we had Egypt, we had the Holocaust. So I believe there's always been incredible anti Semitism. And, that's, you know, the way of the world, but hate exists everywhere. And it's our job to make sure it doesn't exist in our lives. Yeah. Um, okay. This person feels that this was a very vulnerable conversation. I agree with that. No shiz. I think I cried like three times. Um, yeah. Family is very important. I love that this is a Facebook one. Like we never do Facebook ones. Everything's always on Instagram. Yeah. Well, this is on StreamYard. And if people don't approve StreamYard, I don't see who they are. So I feel terrible because it just says Facebook user. Um, we're going to put it on. We're going to put it on all the platforms. So you'll all have yeah. access to it. Yeah. I love that you're so loving. Thank you for bringing so much light. And love I love when people write those comments like you are so awesome and then you're doing the live and you're like thanks thanks <laughs> no stop it you're awesome no no but you know what <laughs> you have an input from people your awesomeness is felt um, that's good that's fine I'll just go cry myself to sleep later but we're in the moment now. <laughs> <laughs> let's see often we grieve for the relationships that could have been and not just the loss of the person. It's so true because you like you have those expectations of what that relationship could be. And oh, definitely, so definitely. It's such an unhealed thinking. By the way, I joke about it in my comedy. I say that that's what I look for in every woman. Every woman is an emotionally unavailable woman. And it's just my mother over and over again. Like, please pay attention to me. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm joking, that's though. Self love. <laughs> yes. <sighs> okay. I cry too. So, well, I hope that, listen, we, we all have those tears. We all have those feelings inside. But I hope that at the end of the day, people can see also the hope, right? The steps that we can take, that we can allow ourselves to grieve, to feel, and then to take action, to take a good action, to move on. And count on the community of the people that want to be part of your community because we need we need the community we need friends we need people we need conversations like this we need support from people that experienced what you know we're experiencing to be able to grow from that add gold understand that we're all we're all kintsugi really yeah we're all kintsugi i think that that was when I realized that we can all mend and we can all put our pieces back together and sprinkle it with gold. Uh, we can then heal. Mm -mm -mm. This could not come at a more timely time in my life. I'm telling you, between your book and the speech and this final last word, literally, I should just actually sprinkle your life with lots of gold. That's yes. It. Yes. 
Thank you guys, everybody, for coming, for being live, for participating. I ask all of you to please share this conversation. The reason I ask you to share, it is not to promote anybody's business. It's not about making money. It is about not knowing who is going to watch this and could be saved from this conversation, who's going to reach out to somebody. Maybe after this conversation, a relationship is going to be healed. Maybe some a, a family member that you haven't spoken mm. to will pick up the call, the phone, and give them a call and reconnect because maybe it's in your in your power. Maybe it is up to you to reconnect and you have no idea that the other person is suffering your loss and, and you're suffering, suffering their loss. To be honest, I think that if somebody could say, you know, I picked up the call, the phone, and I called somebody that I haven't uh, because of some discord and we're, we're going to start a process of reunification. That would be my dream for the purpose of this, of, of this talk today. And if it is something else, then it should be something else. But share, share this video because you have no idea who you can help, whose life you can save, uh, who can get comfort from this conversation. And Sounds good to me. Thank you so much for having me on. It was such an honor. And thank you all of you for tuning in. And um, I appreciate you just as much as you appreciate me. That's for sure. That's wonderful. Good night, everybody.